thousand foot soldiers, and it's a very, no doubt, a very impressive thing. And in verse three, we read that Benjamin heard, and that's it. For whatever reason, Benjamin does not come to this assembly. Now it's very nearby to them, right? This is all taking place within um, the territory near Benjamin. It's sort of, uh, remember Ephraim is the the hill country, and that's where Shiloh is, and Shiloh is probably where the the tabernacle and the ark are. Um, And Benjamin is avoiding this gathering. And some of this, there's a little bit of ambiguity here that you guys will probably pick up on, but um, a couple of things. Is Benjamin wrongfully resisting or wrongfully being absent from this assembly. And then in a moment, we will come to the testimony of the Levite and Israel's response to that, and then Benjamin's response to, all, to Israel's response. And we, we want to look at this and see, um, is everything being done decently in order? But right now, it's important for us that Benjamin's not there. And then Israel asks, how did this wicked deed happen? All right, now we've got to go back into it, the law, right, the books of Moses. Think of, uh, for instance, Deuteronomy um, chapter 13 or Deuteronomy uh, chapter 22. There are, um, if there is um, sodomy or incest or adultery or rape or idolatry, um, everyone together is supposed to take the offender and kill them, okay? And... This is part of what has brought them all together. This finally was the straw that broke the camel's back, it seems. But, you know, just prior to this, we saw a Levite and Micah setting up a shrine and another ephod and another priesthood, and then they're adding these images. Remember, the people of Dan went up and set up an alternative place of worship. And that actually in Deuteronomy chapter 13 should have been cause for war. That the, the whole nation of Israel should have came and put to death those men. It didn't happen then. Now, um, you, and it might, you might say in a certain sense this, this rape and murder is actually a lesser crime than idolatry. Why? Well, because it's immediately against God, not immediately against God. And the difference is, when something is immediately against God, it's kind of like Cain killing his brother. He is killing his brother and using him to get at God, right? But then there are crimes that are directly against God without human instrumentation. The idolatry, like the the violation, say, of the first four commandments, that's immediately, that's striking directly against God as God, without breaking commandments 5 through 10. Do you see the, the, the difference there? Now, all of them are evil, you understand, but I'm just saying that there is a, um, an, an order to them or a hierarchy. of You know, if you can't keep the first commandment, the keeping of all the rest of the commandments is, is not really uh, legitimate. Moreover, just like in Romans chapter 1, you see the regression of a society, they begin with idolatry, with rejecting God, and then part of the judicial um, hardening of them are these other crimes, right? That's where you see the sexual immorality and the foolishness and and the hatefulness and the murder. You see all of those things come out of a prior rejection of God. And so that's what we're seeing taking place in Israel. And when when their attention is brought to them, it is from this, you know, this crime against the woman. All right. But there is a, a question in, that should be in our minds. Why didn't they do this when there was idolatry going on? Why did they not sooner start? Perhaps they could have prevented this kind of wickedness from taking place if they had first banished idolatry. Okay. All right. In verse 4, we pick up, and this is the Levite's report. Now, one thing I want to point out, is in verse 3, it's not as clear in the English, but when they say, um, tell us, how did this wicked deed happen? 
Um, the verb tell us is in the plural. So you all tell us. So they're asking more than one. We're not told who these others are. But there were three witnesses to the crime that we know of. There was the Levite, there was his servant, and then there was the man from Ephraim. That's probable, the three witnesses. And one of the reasons why I think this is important is that on the testimony of two or three witnesses, they're to establish. You can't have a death penalty case, which is what this is. You can't have a capital case without three witnesses. So Israel does seem to be following the law here in the sense that they are, they are seeking to have valid testimony. And it's the Levites whose testimony we have, and we're not told the words of anyone else. Now, is, are his words representative of everyone else's? Or is he speaking only for himself? That's not clear, but Israel at least asked, you all tell us, okay? So in verse 4, the Levite, the husband of the woman who was murdered, answered and said, my concubine and I went into Geba, which belongs to Benjamin, to spend the night. And the men of Geba rose against me and surrounded the house at night because of me. They intended to kill me, but instead they ravished my concubine so that she died. So I took hold of my concubine, cut her in pieces, and sent her throughout all the territory of the inheritance of Israel because they committed lewdness and an outrage in Israel. Look, all of you are children of Israel. Give your advice and counsel here and now. All right, so we read his version of events, and, and on the facts, they're correct. I think he, he correctly tells the things that happened. There are some things that he leaves out that maybe um, he didn't see as important or the background that we're aware of. He didn't talk about her playing the harlot and him going to retrieve her. Um, and he says that the, the, the men of Geba wanted him, which was true. If you remember, they said, send the man out, right? But then he says, um, they intended to kill me. That's perhaps his interpretation of the event. We don't know that. Did they intend? They wanted to know him. He didn't, you know, which, um, did they intend to kill him? We don't know. They, I mean, it, it seems like looking at how they treated the concubine, they probably would have killed him, right? And then he says, but they ravished my concubine and killed her. He doesn't say how it came to pass that his concubine fell into their hands. Um, nevertheless, that, I mean, in terms of uh, the men of Giba, their guilt, it's not really... Uh, lessened by the, that fact, is it? It's still, I mean, that is the truth of the matter. But his testimony does leave out some things, maybe, okay? Now, he appeals to them, it's, and at the end of verse 7, and what he says in verse 7 is, look, all of you are children of Israel. So he's reminding them of who they are, what their responsibility is. Give your advice and counsel here and now. So he's demanding them to make a judgment. And this is very similar to the end of verse 30. Consider it, confer, and speak up. All right, so he's asking them for a ruling on this. Um, before we move on, I just wanted to see if there were any questions or, or thoughts concerning the Levite's testimony, for instance. Um, there's there's a, a sense in which I get... Um, there, there's a background here in that the Levite being a representative of God um, to strike out against the Levite showed uh, you know, wanton disregard for God, right? And that might have aggravated the crime some and that might be why he's telling it in the way that he is. Not even a Levite is safe in this city, Okay. But also, um, just looking at some of the things, I wonder, did he have more owner, more guilt in this than what he has let on here? You know, should he, I mean, he did send his concubine out there. And it was my contention previously that um, 
I think that a man ought to be required to lay down his life for his wife in that circumstance. Um, I don't know that that's easy to say when I'm not in that circumstance, but I do think that that's principally a husband's job. Uh, and probably the report should have been, you know, sodomites in Giba murder Levite and his concubine. That should have been the headline as opposed to what actually happened. Yes, sir. Yes, that's exactly right. I think it's not stated, but I think the implicit notion is that he sent them to all the inheritances in Israel. Yep. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You know, because the Levite should be at the tabernacle. Right. What's he doing? You know, like yes, there's so many. Down and one wife and <sighs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. How you go all the way back to, uh, and there was a Levite, and he took for himself a concubine. That's where the record should skip, and you'd be like, whoa, hang on. But then suddenly now you see pieces of this girl being mailed around Israel, and there's about to be a civil war. That escalated, didn't it? And it starts back with a very simple... It is, and, and something to think about is that the crime that they are incensed about, it, it, they ought to be incensed about it, right? They're right to punish it. But they also seem to have um, had selective outrage, and that in itself is a problem, right? And it, yes, sir. So, <clears throat> Yes, that's right. Yeah, go ahead and deal with that. Yes. That's good. Yes. So I recognize that, like, just in myself. Yep. Yep. But also, like, I'm overwhelmed by the sovereignty of God for allowing all of this to happen. Yeah. Because we see, and it's hard to see, like, a silver lining in any of this, except that. <laughs> And it, yeah, very good. And it, it helps us, I think, looking at the, the contrast between uh, divine justice, heavenly justice, eternal justice, and earthly justice. We're going to see a measure of justice in this story, but it's imperfect, as it will always be on earth, because of imperfect people. So in one sense, the Levites um, withholding, the Levites' guilt in this matter doesn't essentially change the guilt of the Benjamites, right? And so they get what's coming to them on the basis of their own sins, and his involvement doesn't actually mitigate that. Nevertheless, as an individual before the Lord, you know, because we, reading the story, know the details, the Lord knows the details, the rest of Israel doesn't know those details at this time, right? They would have to wait for the book of Judges to be written, perhaps, until they know how it all happened. Yeah. Mr. Alloy. I say too, we have here, to use the categories, the theological categories, we certainly have a lot of violation of moral law all over the place. But the civil law can only do so much. Yes. It has to, it's, it's like 
drag net, you know, just the facts. Yes. They don't need yes. worries about the facts. Yes. You know, it's just like if someone were raped, a woman yes. were raped, yeah. and then we found out that it was after midnight, and she was scantily dressed, and she was intoxicated, that still doesn't mean yeah. that yeah. the person who raped her is guilty. Yeah. Yeah. That person is still guilty. Yep. Uh, and that's yeah. the fact we need to, that's the main fact we need to know. Yeah. Whether that person did was very yep. foolish yep. or wicked. Yep. Getting themselves in that situation or not, yeah. but yeah. And, and so I think the tribes are doing the right yeah. thing. Yes. And they, and when they, yeah. They, they carry out the civil law. Yes, and yes, you're right. It's a good point to make concerning the civil law. How it is an instrument of justice, but it is not itself perfect justice, right? Because it only God sets boundaries to it. What it's to do? It's to punish evil, reward good but it relies upon human mediators, right? You have to have judges and witnesses and, and um, executioners, and they themselves aren't free from sin and ignorance and all of these kinds of things. And so... And that's why we need Christ. Because yeah. Because only he can bring... The, the, perfect, perfect justice. justice. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, one thing to... So when you, when you ask about the, the 12 pieces and the 12 tribes, at the beginning of it, um, in, in verse 1, it says that everyone, all of Israel from from Dan to Beersheba and Gilead. And th- those are kind of like three boundary markers. Uh, Dan, remember we saw they went up to the north. So that's as far north as you could get. Um, Beersheba is down in the south. That's as far south as you can get. And then um, uh, Gilead is to the east. Okay, that's where the, the Transjordan tribes are, like Gad and Manasseh and Reuben. And then obviously the sea is on the, the western border. So, so that was, that's a way in Israel of talking. You know, it would be kind of like if we said... Um, all America from New York to California, right? It, it's a geographical, you know, so th- this did go throughout the whole nation. Yes, yeah, yeah. All right, so Israel then responds in, in verses 8 and following. Um, so all the people arose as one man. Here again we see that they're united. None of us will go to his tent, nor will any turn back to his house. But now this is the thing which we will do to Geba. We will go against it by lot. We will take ten men out of every hundred throughout the tribes of Israel, a hundred out of every thousand, and a thousand out of every ten thousand to make provisions for the people, that when they come to Geba in Benjamin, they may repay all the vileness they have done in Israel. So all the men of Israel were gathered against the city and united together as one man. Then the tribes of Israel Israel sent men through all the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What is this wickedness that has occurred among you? Now, therefore, deliver up the men, the perverted men who are in Geba, that we may put them to death and remove the evil from Israel. Right. We'll stop in the middle of that verse and just look at Israel's response to this. So they get the testimony, and they begin making preparations. They know this is going to be protracted and a big ordeal. So they essentially take one-tenth of the people who will be in charge of making provisions. So that means you're going to need people to gather water, cut wood, get food, you know, because we're going to have to um, stage an army. We're going to have to um, have all these provisions, okay? And they gather against Geba. And in one sense, they're preparing for war. But before they go to war, they send men throughout Benjamin asking for them to tell their side of the story and to to send the criminals forward. There's a similar instance um, in the book of Joshua where it's heard that they set up um, an image or a shrine in another place. And the whole army gathers and goes there. And we, we heard you've got this, this shrine set up. And then they have a conversation, and they say, we, we're not all, it's an altar. And they say, we're not offering sacrifices on this altar, and we're not praying at this altar. What we did is we set up this altar as a monument so that the people of Israel, because these are the Transjordan tribes, so that, the, so that our children and your children will will remember that we're a part of Israel. And it's very strange. They said it's a memorial, and we don't worship at it, and we don't offer sacrifices at it, but we set it up as a copy 
of the altar that's in Israel so that our children and your children will remember we are part of Israel. And then the people of Israel say, oh, okay, that's fine. And then they pull back and they don't go to war. It's a strange story, um, but it shows something different in this, from this case. When Israel came and said, what is this wickedness that's taken place? What's going on here? Send us these criminals. And if the men of Benjamin had said, here are the facts, right, or here are the actual men who did it, let's, that could have avoided a war. But that's not what happened. This is a, the, the men of Benjamin, as we see in the second part of verse 13, is they did not heed or they did not listen to the voice of Israel. Um, did not listen to the voice of their brethren. The, the did not listen, did not heed is the same word um, that the men of Geba used against, uh, when they wouldn't listen to the, the older man from Ephraim, and he said, take my virgin daughter and the concubine. You know, first he said, don't do this wicked thing. They would not heed. Okay, Benjamin now being described with the same kind of language. They won't listen. Um, they should rightfully, if, this crime, if they know this crime has taken place, which we know this having the divine narrator having, we know the facts of the case, right? It's not in dispute. This happened. They should have turned over the criminals and participated in putting them to death. By refusing to do that, they are now implicating themselves, right? Harboring a fugitive in this instance is making them guilty. And we don't know why. We're not told why Benjamin does not follow, why they don't participate. Is it because it's their tribe? You know, and it's Benjamin against the other tribes? You know, that's where their loyalties lay? Or is it because Benjamin is given over, right? That they are, they're doing these kinds of things. They're, that's their, uh, they, they don't desire to punish wickedness because they're doing these kinds of things. But whatever the case, Benjamin says no, and they prepare for war. We'll pick up in verse 14. Instead, the children of Benjamin gathered together from their cities of, to Geba to go to battle against the children of Israel. And from their cities at the time, the children of Benjamin numbered 26,000 men. By the way, we'll pause there. I think coming out of the Exodus, Benjamin was numbered somewhere like 35 or 45,000. So they have actually lost some numbers since then. Uh, which, if you remember, the curses in Deuteronomy, um, the blessings would be they would actually be multiplying. But Benjamin has dwindled. And that's probably indicative um, of their, their failings, right? So they numbered 26,000 men who drew the sword, besides the inhabitants of Geba, who ne- numbered 700 select men. And among all this people were 700 select men who were left-handed. Remember Ehud, left-handed son of a Benjamite? Well, this, for whatever reason, this tribe of Benjamin, they like these left-handed warriors. And every one of them could sling a stone at a hair's breadth and not miss. So they're good with a sling, and it's, you know, it's, a, it's a tactical advantage for them to be left-handed in a time when almost everyone else is right-handed. In verse 17, now besides Benjamin, the men of Israel numbered 400,000 men who drew the sword. All of these were men of war. So Benjamin is outnumbered something like 15 to 1. I mean, it's a, there's a large disparity there. And humanly speaking... It should be a very simple matter, 400,000 to 26,000. Right? That should be very, very simple. Um, and that's why I think we're, that, you know, we're told about the numbers. Okay? Yes, there's these, these crack left-handed guys, right? But 400,000 to 26,000 is not, you know, it, it should be easy for Israel to go in there. Um, in verse 18... The children of Israel arose, and they went to the house of God to inquire of God. They said, which of us shall go up first to battle against the children of Benjamin? Um, depending on your translation, verse 18 may say they went to Bethel. In my translation, it says the house of God. If you look at your map for just a moment, um, you see Bethel or Bethel. 
And then you see up above there is Shiloh. Here's the thing. Um, there is a place called Bethel, or Bethel. Abraham visited there. Um, we've read of it a few other times. It will become prominent later on in Israel. Um, but also, the word Bethel means house of God. The house of God is where the tabernacle is. That's Shiloh. So it's not clear, and that's why translators differ. Are they saying they went up to the house of God, which is in Shiloh, or did they go to Bethel, which sounds like the house of God, which is, by the way, about 10 miles from Shiloh? Um, it's just a sort of an ambiguity. Um, I, I take it, um, and the reason why I take it this way is uh, when um, the, the people of, uh, in Micah's day, um, in chapter, back in chapter 18, verse 31, the Danites, it says, So they set up for themselves Micah's carved image, which he made all the days that the house of God, Bethel, was in Shiloh. So they're not saying the town of Bethel was in Shiloh, right? They're saying the house of God, the tabernacle, was in Shiloh. So my understanding is even though there's a town nearby called Bethel, what's taking place here is that the house of God in Shiloh, that's where the priest is. That's what's, okay, so, but that's the reason why you might find a different translation of that. And my, my position is it's probably talking about the place where God's presence is. That's where the priest is. That's where the ephod is. And that's where they go to inquire. Remember the Urum and the Thummim, right? They go there and inquire, just like they did in Judges chapter 1. Who shall go up? And the Lord says, Judah shall go up. And so here, the Lord says, again, Judah shall go up. Um, Judah goes up in the first instance at the beginning of Judges, and they go up here. Um, there's, it's not clear why, but oftentimes, you know, Judah was prominent. But also, um, the, the woman who was killed was from Judah, the concubine, right? Her, her father was down in, in Bethlehem, in Judah. And so if we think back to chapter 19, that's mentioned. And so Judah is an appropriate, you know, they're, they sort of are the, um, the avenger, right? They, they're the nearest kin, they have first rights, okay? But then we see three battles. Um, and notice in, in verse 18, the Lord answers and says, Judah shall go up. Some commentators I've read is that um, Israel does not ask the Lord whether they should go up, but they're asking who should go up. Um, and that's a mistake. I don't think that's actually an issue. The prescribed word of God says somebody needs to go up. What they don't know is who, right? They know they need to punish this crime. And that, that's one of the things, um, if there's a, a capital crime that takes place, we don't need to know, we don't need to ask God whether we should punish this crime. Like, say, if you're the, the civil magistrate, you don't need to ask whether you need to punish that crime. That's revealed to you by God. Um, now, how you do something in a particular instance may be unknown, right? Like in this instance, of the tribes, who's going to be the one that should go first? That's what they didn't know. But that they needed to go and do it was revealed. That was commanded, okay? But then they go and attack in verses 19 and 20. And this is now at Geba. Then the children of Benjamin came out of Geba, verse 21, and on that day cut down to the ground 22,000 men of the Israelites. And, that, and the people, that is, the men of Israel, encouraged themselves and again formed the battle line. And we'll stop there for just a moment. Just, okay, this should strike us as odd, that 26,000, and then they just killed 22,000. Now, still small in comparison to the 400,000. And the Lord just indicated that Judah should go up. He didn't tell them, don't do this. And they were defeated pretty soundly. So they, they sort of um, regather, and they line up again, and they go and make a second inquiry to God. And 
That begins in verses uh, 22 and 23, actually. They, the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until evening and asked counsel of the Lord, saying, Shall I, notice how Israel is speaking as one, right? Shall I again draw near for battle against the children of my brother Benjamin? There's a lot of things going on there. This, these are their, their brethren, right? And perhaps they're starting to wonder, um, have we made a mistake in this? You know, notice how they're couching it in terms of my brother. The Lord answers. Go up against him. Not them, but him. You know, it's, it's the singular again. Shall I, singular, yes, you, singular, go up against him, singular. The Lord says, yes, this is what you must do. Remember, you must purge the evil from among you. You shall not show mercy against this, Okay. All right, so the Lord said, go up against them. And then, of course, Israel prevailed, and, and all is well. <laughs> verse 25, so, or verse 24, So the children of Israel approached the children of Benjamin on the second day, and Benjamin went out against them from Geba on the second day and cut down to the ground 18,000 more of the children of Israel. All these drew the sword. Drew the sword is a, these are fighting men, okay? And these are not farmers. These are not butchers. These are, these are warriors, and they're slaughtered, 18,000 of them. Verse 26, then all the children of Israel, that is, all the people, went up and came to the house of the Lord and wept. And they sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening. And they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. So the children of Israel inquired of the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, which I take as another indication that they're in Shiloh. By the way, this gives us the timing. Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of... So Phinehas, the grandson of Aaron. So this is probably taking place early on, right? Early on in, in, in the book of Judges stood before, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of my brother Benjamin, or shall I cease? Reasonable question. They had 22,000 wiped out one day, 18,000 the next day. So perhaps we've erred. And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into your hand. So uh, just some thoughts. Why did the Lord sanction their mission twice only to have them fail twice? Um, And here is something that I think we need to wrestle with a little bit is um, the mystery of God's providence, right? They were right in their cause. They were just in their cause. And they had, humanly speaking, the resources to carry it out. Nevertheless, the Lord allowed them to fail twice, even though he told them to go ahead. And just a reminder here that sometimes being right and and having God's approval doesn't mean we won't suffer loss. Do you see, you can, you know, we tend to think that if I'm right, if the Lord is on my side, all will go well. Israel was right. God did approve of it. Nevertheless, for his own reasons, he still allowed them to suffer loss. And they were probably thinking, that's why they had to come back, and shall we go up again? And you will find yourselves like this, right? I'm, I'm doing what I know is right, or I think is right, and I'm suffering. Why? Well, maybe what you need to do is evaluate, am I doing what's right? But don't expect that just because you're doing what's right, that everything will always fall into place. You may suffer for doing what's right. And that's, I think, going on here. The Lord, in his providence, is also dealing with Israel. Perhaps there is sin in Israel, right? They had not dealt with the issue of idolatry yet. They had not dealt with maybe some of their own sins. And probably the um, terrible losses that Israel suffered are related to the sins 
in Israel that have not yet been dealt with. And it is only after the, when they come the third time and they give offerings, they give sacrifices to atone for sin, then they go out and they're victorious. It's interesting because the Lord in this instance says, I will uh, give Benjamin into your hand. That expression, we've read it dozens of times in the book of Judges, going all the way back to chapter 1. And it's always like when the Lord is going to give one of the Canaanites into the hands of the people of Israel or to the judges. Or when the Lord delivers his people into the hands of one of their enemies because of their disobedience. So the Lord himself says, I'm going to give them into your hands. So they know they're going to win, and yet look what they do. They, they have a strategy. They do an ambush, right? And that takes place in verses 26 through 36, and I'm just going to summarize briefly what happens. So they, they go out to, to, to battle as normal, and when Benjamin comes out to meet them, a second force of Israel comes down to Geba and sets it on fire. Then the people of Benjamin retreat back to Geba, and when they get to Geba, they find themselves between a hammer and an anvil. And as they turn their backs to the main force, they, they come together. And so they're, they're surrounded and destroyed. And um, just a, a thought on this is that even though they had a just cause and they had God's assurance that they would be victorious, they still used means. They still used a strategy. See, we, even though we have assurance of God being on our side, even though we have assurance of victory, we still have to think and still have to use means and methods and strategies. And in this case, they did. Right? Um, let's see. We have so much to cover, but not enough time. Um, okay, <laughs> I told you guys this would happen. All right, so then in, in verses 36 to the end, we get um, a detailed account of the same battle. And maybe I'll just read that and we'll close with that. So the children of Israel, excuse me, the children of Benjamin saw that they were defeated. The men of Israel had given ground to the Benjamites because they relied on the men in ambush whom they had set against Geba. And the men in ambush quickly rushed upon Geba. The men in ambush spread out and struck the whole city with the edge of the sword. Now the appointed signal between the men of Israel and the men in ambush was that they would make a great cloud of smoke rise up from the city, whereupon the men of Israel would turn in battle. Now Benjamin had begun to strike and kill about 30 of the men of Israel. For they said, surely they are defeated before us as in the first battle. But when the cloud began to rise from the city in a column of smoke, the Benjamites looked behind them and there was the whole city going up in smoke to heaven. This is like a, a burnt offering. This is a sacrifice. Right? This, and the, everyone, every Israelite would have recognized that, the, this column of smoke going up to heaven. Verse 41, And when the men of Israel turned back, the men of Benjamin panicked, for they saw that disaster had come upon them. Therefore they turned their backs before the men of Israel in the direction of the wilderness, but the battle overtook them. And whoever came out of the cities, they destroyed them in their midst. They surrounded the Benjamites, chased them, and easily trampled them down as far as the front of Geba toward the east. And 18,000 men of Benjamin fell. All these were men of valor. Then they turned and fled toward the wilderness to the rock of Ramon, and they cut down 5,000 of them on the highways. Then they pursued them relentlessly up to Gedim, and killed 2,000 of them. So all who fell of Benjamin that day were 25,000 men who drew the sword. All these were men of valor. But 600 men turned and fled toward the wilderness to the rock of Ramon, and they stayed at the rock of Ramon for four months. And the men of Israel turned back against the children of Benjamin and struck them down with the edge of the sword. From every city, men and beasts, all who were found. They also set fire to all the cities they came to. And next time, we'll pick up with the, the aftermath of this all, but um, one thing I wanted to 
emphasize in all of this is at the end at verse 35, the Lord defeated Benjamin before Israel, and the children of Israel destroyed that day 25,100 Benjamites, all those who drew the... The Lord was the one who killed Benjamin, right? Just as we saw when the Lord would raise up a judge and he would defeat their enemies. So there's no question that whatever else happened, the Lord was against Benjamin for this crime. And the Lord actually used his people to destroy his own people um, because of their sin. And that's, this is going to continue into the next chapter, right? There's going to be more, but just starting where we've looked, where we're at in the book of Judges, right? We see um, Israel coming into the land with Joshua and each of them getting their inheritance and being told to go and destroy the Canaanites. And yet one of the most detailed battles that we're seeing is actually not a battle against Canaanites, but it's a battle against Benjamites who are behaving like Canaanites. All right. Um, I'll stop there for today. I wanted to let you know, next Sunday and the Sunday after it, I will not be here. Um, Don Maurer is going to teach a two-part class um, he calls The Last Enemy, which is death. Um, so I encourage you, if you, you know, it'll be a benefit to you to do that. And then when I return, we'll pick up with judges, and we'll see where that leaves us. All right? All right, let me pray for us. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. We do ask that you would establish it in our hearts. We pray for your blessing today as we gather to worship you, that our hearts, Lord, would be open before you, and that you would fill them, O oh Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, with good things. Thank you in Christ's name. Amen.